God is good. All the time. All the time. All right. Good morning, church. There's less of you this week. I got all the new chairs and nobody's sitting in them. <laughs> well, I hope everybody's doing okay that stayed in town for spring break. Looks like a lot of people didn't. Um, some announcements this morning. I have two sign-up sheets out under the television in the lobby for our annual Baltimore Oh Give Thanks trip and for our men's retreat to Caswell. They're in September and November, but I wanna go ahead and start getting some names and figure out how many people we're gonna have going on these trips. So please sign up out there if you're interested in going on those trips. It's not a final commitment, but just to show some interest. Uh, greeters meeting next Sunday following church in the commons room. Greg wants to have a meeting with the greeters, so all you guys and ladies, please meet back there next Sunday after service. Small groups are cranking back up today. We had a huge week and a half break. They're cranking back up today. If you're interested in a small group, they're all posted on the board out here. And you can also get with me and I'll get you pointed in the right direction. There's one that's not out there that's a possibility. Irene, would you stand up, please? Dave Ramsey. This lady has a passion for it. If anybody's interested in taking the Dave Ramsey class, please get with Irene or myself and we'll get one started up, correct? We'll get one going. Um, Dave Ramsey. We'll mention the name of it. I know I'm drawing a blank. That's why I didn't mention it. <laughs> I was trying to cover up my ignorance, Todd. <laughs> Financial peace. 
it was rolling around in my brain. I was trying to figure it out. Thanks for calling me out. <laughs> How red am I? Okay. Uh, monthly churchwide prayer meeting tonight at 530. Please come out for that. In two weeks, we have a roadside cleanup on the 20th at 8 a.m. So please start thinking about that. And if we get 20 people out here, we'll be done so fast. If we have five people out here, we're not going to do it all. So please have 20. Annie Armstrong, I started off this morning thinking we had 6,500, but we we're up to 8,400. <clears throat> but our goal is 9,500, so don't clap too hard. We need 1,100 more, so please get us over that hump. This is the last week we're taking money for that. So we're at 8,400. Our goal is 9,500. Envelopes are in the back of the seats if you feel led to give. And I think I got everything. Our scripture for today is Lamentations 3, 22 to 23. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your faithfulness, Lord. Where we slip and fall and fail, Lord, you're always steady, always reliable, and always perfect. So we just thank you so much, and we come here this morning to worship you, to worship your greatness, to worship your steadfastness and your loyalty. Even when we were your enemies, you loved us and you died for us. Thank you so much, King Jesus. Amen. Ladies, I just wanted to let you know that on April the 19th, we are having a women's craft night. This is not some willy-nilly thing. We are going to be creating things to put in your home and also outside of your home that is going to reflect Christ. And it's going to be a night of painting things that will have scripture and it will have little symbols of, of things that are just going to show the world and your family what our lives are all about. So please sign up and plan to attend. Amen. Let's hope we can all get in on that. And everyone, please stand and let's worship our Lord. We worship you.
will change. I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life in Jesus' name. in prayer. Would you join me? Lord, there's no other name under heaven that we might be saved other than the name of Jesus. So I pray that as we worship that we just continue to write your words on our heart. You continue to guide our pastor to, to bring the word of life to us. But I pray that when we give of our offerings it's an act of worship and we would take it to lift up the name of Jesus so that those who need hope would find it, that those who would need to find eternal life We'll find it in the name of Jesus. It's in your precious name we worship. Dear Jesus, we love you. Amen. Amen. Still, I'm the one 
copy of the Word of God to the book of Numbers, the book of Numbers chapter 20. I've said a couple of times to a few folks this morning that I was tempted last night to turn this one sermon into about four and make it a series, but um, I'm starting a whole new series this morning on meltdown. You ever had a meltdown? You know anybody that's ever had a meltdown? You married it? Oh, never mind. So, um, <laughs> you know, a lot of times we preach the, the virtues of biblical characters. And sometimes we hold those virtues so high that it seems like it's unattainable for us to reach them. So we lift them as examples. We look to them for leadership. But very seldom do we find us teaching and preaching about the weak moments in their lives. Today I'm going to be preaching and teaching you about Moses and his character trait or fault of anger. Whether it was healthy anger or unhealthy anger, it was something that consistently showed up in his life and his ministry. Next week we're going to be looking at Elijah after he has a victorious battle with the 400 prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, he then runs in fear from Jezebel and is afraid of the queen. And then in the New Testament, we look at Peter, who was the rock. But at a time where Christ was at his weakest, fulfilling the plan of redemption, Peter denied him three times. And then we'll get to the final message, King Nebuchadnezzar from the book of Daniel, who absolutely went mentally insane for seven years and thought he was an animal and lived in the wilderness. You don't hear many preachers talk about meltdowns like that. And you'll find some sermon series out there that relate to this. And um, 
I was been doing some studying over the last, this probably came to me in January or February, something like that. And uh, I said, I'm going to be preaching a couple sermon series um, uh, that's going to kind of kick off our summer. One of the, for the entire month of April, I'm going to be preaching about meltdowns. And then after that, I think I've got about six sermons. I'm going to be preaching through the Gospels where Jesus had dinner with people. And uh, the sermon series is called Dinner with Jesus. And what happens when you invite Christ to your table and things change, things, things can happen. And during that series, I'm going to encourage you to invite people into your homes and have dinner with friends or even maybe folks you don't know. And at least once during the six weeks of doing that, I'm going to encourage you to to have dinner with Jesus and some friends in your home um, during that series. And I hope, I hope you'll do that because I think it'll be, um, I think it'll be interesting and, and I think it'll be helpful for you as well. But today, um, man, there's so many instances in the scriptures where Moses just lost it. And I mean, anger got the better of him. And um, I mean... He's a hero of the faith in one aspect. He was a friend of God in another. But there are times where I look at the anger that controlled just under the surface in his life and could rear its ugly head. And I, and I don't ever want to be like that. But I think we need to look at that. So here, here's how this sermon goes. So let me, let me help you understand something. The first three points are very long passages of Scripture that describe what happened in uh, his, in Moses' life, in showing you moments of anger. But I, I don't want to preach all three of those because those are three separate sermons that we could spend a lot of time in. But I'm using those to help you understand uh, the character trait of anger in his life. Point number four is the text we're going to be looking at in Numbers 20 and his final meltdown before God and before the people. And that's what we're going to get to. So this is going to be a three-point introduction and a one-point sermon. Okay? That's kind of how I'm, in my mind I'm seeing this. So I hope, I hope you get that. So I won't even get to the scripture until we get to point number four. So don't try to look up and read all these long texts. I mean, the first point is the entire second chapter of Exodus. Y'all know I can't preach a whole chapter in one sermon. Y'all know that, right? Y'all do know that, right? Okay. Just checking. So um, let's get started. So first off, um, before we open the word of God, let's go ahead and do something. Look at your neighbor and say these words. You are too broke to go to the beach. So I'm glad you're here. <laughs> Can I get an amen? All right. So I'm glad we're here. Think about this for a moment. I love the character of Moses. I mean, for heaven's sakes, uh, I, I mean, some of y'all have probably learned more about Moses from um, Cecil B. DeMille's Ten Commandments than you have the scriptures. And that's not a bad thing, but I want you to dig into this. So one thing you're going to find in his life, he was a natural born leader, but he didn't always think so. I mean, he had he was blessed with a lot of numerous uh, gifts. The Bible says in Exodus 2 2 and in, in Acts 7 20, he was good looking. In Acts 7 22, that he was intelligent. Don't go to Numbers 20 yet. I ain't nowhere near that. I got like 20 minutes before I get there. Yeah, just go, go, to, go to point number one, but don't fill it in yet. I mean, he had unparalleled opportunity. He was eloquent uh, of speech when he was in Egypt, and then, then he had a great leadership ability. And, 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 while trying to use his God-given capacity for leadership, he was at the same time trying to seek how to control a seething, just under the surface fire of anger kind of in his belly that was really his Achilles heel. And while Moses was following the clear direction of God, his anger would occasionally flare up and just kind of overtake the moment. And sometimes it... It, it, was, it was a bad thing for his, 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 well, I'm not going to get to it, but there were consequences. 
Moses had so many episodes of anger until he had one final meltdown. Here's the first one. In Exodus chapter 2, Moses was angry over the injustice of God's people. Remember when he was 40 years old, he made a critical choice. He determined not to be identified with the life of privilege that he had been reared uh, uh, in Egypt. Uh, but he, he, he decided to um, join himself to his, his enslaved Hebrews when he found out his heritage and, and his blood and, and that he shared with them. And, and this would be amazing in any other condition, but for Moses... It's just an incredibly dramatic effect because what he left behind was wealth and education and, and fame and power and authority. I mean, he just wasn't an Egyptian. He was like up there as Pharaoh's grandson. And then you'll see later on that, that, that he became uh, uh, a rival of the Pharaoh later in years when he was raised with. But I'm telling you, even the book of Hebrews says, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, Moses, he looked to the reward, and by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. In other words, he saw God as more important than the Pharaoh. He looked to God as his king and not the earthly king. And before Moses walked away, he did something, though. When he joined himself with the Hebrews, he witnessed a Hebrew being abused by an Egyptian taskmaster. And Moses took matters into his own hand, and he ended up killing the Egyptian taskmaster, buried him in the sand, and this was not... God's answer to freeing God's people, because Moses didn't have the power in and of himself to do that. So by fear, he ran to the backside of the desert for 40 years. So the first instance of his anger was over how the Egyptians treated God's people. He got so angry that he murdered someone. I don't know about you, but that's pretty angry. Second instance that Moses got angry was in Exodus chapter 11, verse 8. Forty years had passed in the blowing sands of the desert, and Moses got angry over Pharaoh's rebellion against God. Think about this. He had been humbled for 40 years on the backside of the wilderness in this barren desert. He was about to face a new challenge when God was about to lead him into Pharaoh's court, back to where he came from. And, and, and God surprised Moses by showing up in a burning bush in Exodus chapter 3 and 4. And from the bush, God told Moses that he was going to use him to lead his people out of Egypt. Well, God, that sounds like a good idea. But to Moses, he's like, God, this doesn't sound like a good idea to me. He remembered his last effort to be a hero and it didn't work out so well. And you want me to take on Pharaoh? But from the conversation in the burning bush, Moses realized that he had little choice but return to the place which he had fled. In other words, God was going with him. Imagine what was going on in the inner turmoil of Moses' mind and heart and everything that was going, that he was returning to the place he spent 40, the first 40 years of his life until he fled. And things were different this time. No longer did Moses stand in the the finery of Egypt, so to speak. But he was coming back dressed as a nomadic shepherd from the sandy regions of the desert. And he's going to come tell Pharaoh, release your entire workforce. Uh, he didn't think that was going to go very well. But Moses didn't understand everything yet. He had to step forward, not in his own strength this time, but he had to go in the strength of God, and that God was going to be the power and the power alone that would do it. So what was Moses' part? What was his responsibility? It was just to trust God enough to stand in the Egyptian court and tell Pharaoh what God told him to say. He did not have to accomplish the deliverance, but he did have to believe God to do his part. So God's plan was to carry out 
a, 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 to Pharaoh's rebellion when, when, when Moses tells him what's going on, God says, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to show you that I am that I am. I'm going to show you I'm a real God. So Moses, God, God brings 10 supernatural interventions or plagues or, or these curses against Egypt and, and to attack their spiritual heart. They were a polytheistic culture that worshipped all kinds of gods. And every god that they worshipped in the ten plagues, God attacked every one of them with a plague. It's a very interesting study if you're interested. But the plagues express God's righteous anger. And this time, Moses has the same anger. And this time, it's a healthy anger. It's a righteous anger at how God's people were being treated. But... I'll just give you a few examples. I'm not going to go through all ten. But remember the first one? When, they, when, when God turned the river Nile into... Y'all watched the movie, right? I, I can remember it now. I thought one of the coolest scenes in the movie was when the fountain started running. But remember the fountain? Y'all remember? All right, some of y'all need to watch the movie. The fountain starts running blood. Listen, did you know that they worshipped a god named Happy or are happy H A P I and Osiris, who were supposedly gods of the River Nile. They worshipped the Nile as a god. Yet those gods couldn't save the river from being turned to blood. And and then then the the, the next uh, plague was the 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 swarms of frogs. I bet a lot of Egyptians had warts that week. Amen. Think about it. They worshipped the frog god, Het, H-E-Q-T, as a symbol of fertility and resurrection. And yet they couldn't get rid of those. Dust. And the Hebrew word for dust, or, or, or some people say lice, is actually the word gnats. It was, I, I mean, could you imagine all the no that they just couldn't deal with? Oh, my goodness. And, and then the fourth one was swarms. And, and, uh, and, and, and some people say that this was the dog fly that was a blood-sucking insect that laid eggs on all the other insects. And when it bit you, it inflicted a very painful wound. Any guys ever been deer hunting and been bit by a deer fly? That hurts. Those dudes don't. They, they're, this, this bite is supposed to be uh, just a voracious appetite. And they attacked every man and woman, it says, and that was the fourth plague. The fifth plague was pestilence. The sixth plague was boils and then storm and hail and locust. And then down to the, the, the locust was um, uh, uh, attacked their crops and, and ate them. And Osiris was a, also the protector of agriculture, was totally ineffective in, in this plague as well. Then darkness affected the, the, the Egyptian god Ra. You've heard that one, right? The god of the sun, Babylonian called it uh, Re, R-E. In Egypt it was R-A, the sun god. And yet the Bible says that the darkness, the plague was so thick that you could feel it. But then it gets to the tenth plague. The death of the firstborn man and animal in, in Exodus 11 and 12. And this plague marked the failure of of Pharaoh himself. Think about this for a moment. Because remember, Pharaoh was considered to be a god. And he was worshipped. Yet he was powerless to stop it, even losing his own firstborn. God was establishing, with this final blow, and executing his righteous anger over Pharaoh and all of Egypt's gods, or at least ten of them, that the God of the Hebrews demonstrated that he was indeed the one true God and the power and authority over all creation and that he would use any means necessary to secure the freedom of his people. Yet even with all of this suffering, all these plagues, God displayed his mercy. He made a way of escape on the tenth and final plague. He gave them a warning. He gave them the plan. He gave them a way out. To, to allow the firstborn to be covered. He made a provision, and the vision was to, to save the firstborn, that they would not have to die, and, 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 and is to provide a substitute in his place and provide that blood on the doorpost of the home. Yet, Pharaoh didn't do that. The Egyptians didn't do that. Many didn't. But that was the beginning 
The firstborn was supposed to be a flawless lamb slaughtered and his blood placed on the door of the house of the homes and the, and the death angel would pass over. And that's where the Jewish feast of Passover began. And it's a precursor and a picture that there is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. And it points us all the way to the cross. Even back in Egypt, God showed his mercy. We read from Lamentations this morning in chapter 3, verse 3. The Lord's mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Even in the midst of divine judgment, God demonstrated his, his faithfulness to mercy. And the great sadness here, though, as in Egypt, is it never needed to happen. But it happened... In the midst of mercy, in the midst of a loving God providing a way, the judgment happened because Pharaoh hardened his heart against the warnings of Moses. How many people in this day and time have heard the warnings of the gospel and hardened their hearts? My friend, God's mercy is still new every morning. Listen to the warnings. Don't let calamity fall upon you. Don't let judgment fall upon you. Don't let your rebellion be stronger than God's mercy. And God gave through Moses the warning, let my people go. In other words, repent. Turn away from your sin. Show it through your actions. But Pharaoh would not, and the nation of Egypt did not, and they suffered the consequences because of their sin and the sins of their leaders, and it affects their followers every single time. Even in the midst of all the plagues, to the last one, God showed mercy, even in his righteous anger. Then the third time Moses showed his anger was in Exodus 32, 19. And that was, the Mos that was Moses over the anger of the Hebrews' idolatry. And this was when righteous anger turned into furious rage. It started off as righteous anger, but it ended up as purity sin. And Moses messed up. A few weeks into the wilderness, God called Moses to the rock, uh, the top of a rocky mountain named Sinai. And as the people of Israel waited below, God wrote the two stone tablets of his laws for his, uh, his new society, the people of Israel. And if you look back on this, we can see what of, what, some of what God was doing. You see, for any nation to function, it's got to have a seed of morality. It has to have a system of law. And for Israel, the value of these laws was dramatically increased by the fact that they were not just a nation of people. They were a nation of God's people. And God gave them the laws. And God's laws are to be followed by God's people. And it was meant to demonstrate God's goodness to the world. And these laws were summed up in, in ten commandments. And it would indicate whether or not they were going to show love to God and for themselves and one another. But something went wrong. There was an immediate violation in Exodus 20, 32 verses 1 through 14. And as important as these laws were, the people of Israel were breaking them as just as they were being given. As, as Moses was on top of the mountain receiving them, the people were down on the bottom of the mountain breaking them. If, if, if that isn't the, the epitome of this day in which we live in, can you see the similarities? We can proclaim from the mountaintops the grace of God, the word of God, the law of God, and, and, and be a few feet away from people breaking the laws that we're proclaiming. Listen carefully. The first four of the Ten Commandments were about how to, how to have a proper relationship with God. And Moses was laying these out. And, and, and God was writing them. And it was showing you how to worship the invisible God from, from the top of Mount Sinai and into your heart. And, and while he was receiving that, his brother Aaron had been convinced to, to fashion a golden calf for the people's hearts of stone. God was giving them his commandments and writing them on his heart of flesh on top of the mountain. And at the bottom of the mountain, they were fashioning a golden calf because their, their hearts had turned to stone. The God that had just 
released them through ten plagues and through his, his, his power and authority in Egypt. And then just a few weeks after, they turn and say, make us a god. The Israelites lost sight of the reality for a moment. And how can the invisible God who demonstrated his power over the visible and the material world through the plagues now be, be I mean, the, he, he opened the Red Sea, he brought them across dry land, he gave them daily provision of, of food and, and water, and, and now they're reducing him down to a, a, a golden calf made with human hands? How far they had fallen. It's like the picture of paganism found in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 23. If you read that, that's a description of our day and time, where people turn to worship the creator, the creation rather than the creator. All this climate stuff going on is Romans chapter 1, folks. It's people worshiping the creation and not the creator. And every climate frenzied person you talk to, they never talk about the Creator, but they always talk about the climate. It is a cult of religion. Don't be fooled to think that it's a social movement. It is a cult of religion, of worship. Everybody all right out there? You know, Is it okay to tell the truth in here? If you don't believe me, read Romans chapter 1, verses 8 through 2 and 3. Don't do it now, because I'm not done yet. Do it later. But what their actions revealed is how little they've learned. I'm telling you that if that's not the epitome of America right now, our actions are revealing how very little we've learned. And even as God was speaking to Moses on the mountain, the Hebrews were corrupting themselves on the plain below, and, and now it was about to they were about to pay the price, and Moses went from a 40-day a one-on-one -on -one experience with God on the mountain to an absolute fit of rage. It reminds me sometimes what I see when people leave church and get in their cars. You'd a fit of rage by the time you get to Ramsey Street. How do I know that? Don't ask. A return to anger. This is what he does. He, he's, he just jumps right back into it. And, and, and it's important to see that through Moses' eyes, the events that follows, think about it for a moment. He just spent 40 days in communion with God. 40 days with the Lord. On the mountain. Receiving the Ten Commandments. And, and nothing but pure and holy in the presence of God. But when he came down from the mountain, he experienced culture shock. The farthest thing from his mind, religious adultery. And, and Moses saw at the foot of the mountain a profaned relationship with God that had just enveloped his people. And how did Moses respond? <laughs> he took the tablets of stone that God had just written on with his finger and threw them and broke them over the idol. Now think for a moment. What do people do when they have fits of rage? They throw things. They punch things. They say things. And they do things that they usually don't do if they're not angry. Anger has a way of getting the best of you. Do y'all see this in the scriptures? Am I the only one? Y'all see this, right? He threw. I mean, it's like... Back when I was growing up, when you spoke back to your mama, you got beat with the closest thing that was near her hand. Y'all remember that? <laughs> sometimes it was a broom, and sometimes it was the iron. Man, the iron hurt, y'all. Even a cold iron hurts, I'm telling you. No, I'm just joking. My mama never hit me with an iron. I think she was tempted a few times. Holy moly. Then, then to show the children of Israel that, that no God formed with human hands could overcome the power of God Almighty, 
Moses took the idol, threw it in the fire, then he pulverized it into ashes, threw it across the water, and made them drink the water. I don't know about you, but that's just seething anger. Pounding that thing. Barty broke the, the tablets. He pounds and crushes the idol. Now drink it. I mean, that, that's anger, isn't it? That's rage. I mean, it's, it's, it's bad enough to throw the tablets then to carry through with that. I'd be like, <laughs> it's kind of like when, when the children are like, when daddy gets home and he's fighting with mom, everybody's like, y'all be quiet. Daddy's in a bad mood. Moses is in a bad mood, y'all. The golden calf was not able to save itself from Moses. One man couldn't alone save itself from the wrath of God. Certainly not. Idols never overpower God. Could it be that, that, that Moses' temper could tell us something about the law that God was giving? As important as the law is in showing us what a right relationship with God looks like, the law can't save those who violate it. A broken law can only condemn but the law cannot save. Only God can save. All the law does is point out your sin. But it doesn't save you from your sin. The law does nothing but condemn. God is the one who forgives. So now we get to the final meltdown. Number four. This is where the sermon begins. Isn't that, wasn't that a great introduction? <laughs> 20 minute So... Here, here's where the rubber hits the road, and here's where I want to get into the text. So we're, we're going to look at the text first in, in, in Numbers 20, 8 through 11, and then, I'll, then I'm going to preach this section and we're going to close. So here's, here's, here's the final straw for God and for Moses. In Numbers chapter 20, verses 8 through 11, it says this, Take the staff and assemble the congregation, you and Aaron, your brother, and tell the rock. In some of your translations it says, Speak to the rock before their eyes to yield its water. See, the people were complaining about not having water for themselves and their, and their, and their, and their um, livestock. So, so he says, So you bring water out of the rock for them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. And Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he commanded him, then Moses and Adam Garrett gathered the assembly together before the rock. And he said to them, here now, you rebels. Oh, he's already in a bad mood. Name calling is when anger starts brewing. Shall we bring water for you out of this rock? You know who he's talking about? Him and Aaron. Do we have to do this for you? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock. Twice. He did it twice. And then water came out abundantly. The congregation drank and their livestock. What did God tell them to do? Say it loudly. Speak, Speak to the rock. What did Moses do? Struck the rock. Number four. Let's go, let's go on and go to this number four right now. Moses' anger over the Hebrews complaining was his final meltdown. It was complaining. After 38 years of leading these stubborn people through the wilderness, it seemed like going back and forth, one day Moses was trying to talk God out of killing them, the other day God was trying to talk Moses out of killing them. I mean, if you read it, it's, it's, a, it's a crazy uh, symbiotic relationship. But, but here, when we get to the very end of it, Moses fails again. After all the victories he'd had, he blows it. And he does it through anger. And he has this final meltdown. But this time, it's not against Pharaoh. It's not against injustice. It's against God. What does he do? 
He disobeys God and doesn't speak to the rock and he strikes the rock. And it's a direct reflection on God. His mere human frustration that made him blow his top in anger. It's kind of like you've heard the statement, I got one nerve left and you're on it. I, 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 I grew up with my mama telling me that I was on her last nerve almost every day. And what we would find is that the earlier in the day when she was on the last nerve, that's how bad the day was going to be. If she said that at breakfast, it was going to be a bad day. You're on my last. But if she said it later on at night, we, we, we just go on to bed. It was going to be okay. But if you got on mama's last nerve at breakfast, it was going to be a long day. Moses had a last nerve and he blew it. And here's what he did. The people complained. He struck the rock. And he didn't speak to the rock. He called them rebels. He claimed authority and ability to bring forth the water for him and Aaron. And then he struck it a second time and brought forth water. Here's why this happened to Moses and what God did. He did not treat God as holy. It's in the text if you keep reading he didn't treat God as holy. God, God told him specifically what to do, and he took it upon himself to do something different. So here's three things I want to teach you today from the Word of God. You ready? Number one, we all agree, meltdowns happen, but they come with consequences. I, I can show you uh, uh, scars of broken glass and dented items in my home that came from meltdowns not mine but someone else and not, mine. And, and not Angela's <laughs> probably, probably should make that clear I got a score back here no I'm just kidding I, I, I've experienced these in my family you may have I don't know if you have or not but I, I, I've, I've seen anger up close I'm telling you, meltdowns happen to us. Anger can get the best of us. We're not exempt from the consequences when we do things or say things while we're angry and furious. In this account, Moses' heart got so furious with people's, the people of God complaining that his heart was fully explodes, exposed. And, and he acted in frustration and anger and selfish indignation and fury. In other words, Moses acted in sin. Let's call it what it is. This was not righteous anger. This was not healthy anger. This was sinful anger. He went that far. And how tragic it was for Moses that he had returned at the end of his ministry all the way back to the beginning. He never got over his anger issues. They followed him his whole life. And, and he presented himself as the answer to, 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 to meet the, the needs of God's people rather than God. The same way he had done with the killing of the Egyptian taskmaster. He took it in his own hands. I'm going to free the people of Israel. I'm going to start with this taskmaster. I'm going to provide water for God's people. And he started by striking the rock. He took it in his own hands. But it was all done in the context of anger. I believe anger makes you do things that, that are irrational. Anger makes you do things that you, that you haven't thought through. Because they're impulsive. They happen so quick. That's what Moses was suffering from. And, and he battled with anger, and it wasn't a struggle for a day or a week or a year, but he battled with anger his entire lifetime. He struggled with it. And it cost him dearly. I mean, how can you go from spending 40 days with God in pure worship and holiness on the top of Mount Sinai, and minutes later smash the Ten Commandments and pulverize that and then make the Israelites drink it. That's from going to the mountaintops of the valley quick like in a hurry, isn't it? That's anger. Anger will terminate your goals. <laughs> It'll bring you down. And in this case, he forfeited the privilege of leading the children into the promised land. God said, 
You're not going to do it. So how did God respond to Moses? <sighs> Anger was Moses' ultimate downfall. And though there were times he displayed healthy anger or righteous anger, that's anger where you get angry but you do not sin. And, and, and he also displayed a comparable anger that matched God's anger over Pharaoh. God responded differently with consequences when he displayed an anger sin, a sinful anger where, where it was all about him, and that's what this was in Numbers 20. His consequences was to forfeit his entrance into the promised land. And though that might seem harsh after all that Moses did and all that he went through, he died alone with only one person that attended his funeral, according to Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 1 through 12. And the only person that attended Moses' funeral was God. So if you're going to have only one person attend your funeral, make sure it's God. Hello? Now, some will say, and, and they're probably right, that, that God didn't allow Moses to go into the promised land and die there of old age because they would have worshipped him and set up a shrine and put his body in a sepulcher or something in a tomb, or, and they would have worshipped the body of Moses. They're probably right about that. Moses may have, somehow, his heart may have shifted, and, and he might have claimed victory over it and took credit for what God had done, stolen God's glory. I don't know if he would have done that, but some people said he might have. Well, the Bible says that he forfeited entrance into the promised land because of his anger, and I'm just going to stay with that. All the other is speculation. The truth of the matter is, God responded to his consequences by attending his funeral. And I don't know about you, but that's a tender, loving God. The third thing is this. Meltdowns can happen to anybody. Hello? Look at your neighbor and say, they can happen to you. You look back and say, they can happen to you too. <laughs> Listen. Anger happens to every one of us. And sometimes it's a righteous anger. And, and, and other times it's a sinful anger and it gets the best of you. Sometimes we, we feel anger when we, when we ball up our fist and we tighten up our jaw. Because anger can make you, as we've seen in the scriptures, it can make you break things, it'll make you throw things, it'll make you strike things. That's what Moses did, every one of them. And when anger gets out of control, it can quickly spread like a wildfire. It's not a controlled burn. It gets out of control and turns into a forest fire. And anger should not be your major defining characteristic. You're going to get angry because you're a human. The scripture's clear about that. We all know that. If you do, or when you do, I should say, learn how to control it and do not let it control you. It's going to happen. For some of you, it's going to happen before you eat lunch today. That's how sure I am of the human condition and how frail. Yeah, we think we come to church and we've got wings of eagles and we're apt to fly. I'm telling you, you've got feet of clay and you're apt to fall. Everybody all right out there? How do I know that, that you can get angry and, 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 and burn with anger before you go to lunch today? Because it's happened to me. It's happened before I've left the building before. Before, right after I've preached and even gotten into my truck. I've controlled it to the best of my ability. Some people may have seen it on my face, but they didn't say anything. But they know me well. But somebody, I'm not calling out any names. They're not here today. No, I'm just kidding. I don't know. Just... <laughs> Do you know how some people just push your buttons? And, and in an instant, it's like, on, they push my anger button. And you just feel it mm, coming up. 
And if you weren't a godly man or woman, you'd tell them off or knock them out. I can't tell you how many people I've wanted to knock in the nose in the name of Jesus over the years. I have. Man, I've been jacked up against the wall. I've had people grab my shirt and my tie. That was when I was a preacher. I wore a suit on Sundays. I'm a teacher, so I wear blue jeans. Anyway, um, I have. I've had them jack me up against the wall and grab my tie and, and tell me if I preach past 12 o'clock one more time, I'm going to ruin that church and blah, 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 blah. Man, I wanted to, I wanted to introduce them to... Anyway... But I, I didn't, I, I kept, I held back. I've had people say things before that they think are, are funny. Some of y'all ain't funny, you're just rude. We need to think about how we, we treat each other and, 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 and how we, we say things and do things and, and, and just get on that last nerve. In all seriousness, if anger is an issue that you deal with, do not let it be your defining characteristic. Because if you do, it will eventually control you and you will not learn how to control it. You and I should be in charge of all of our emotions. And your will should be surrendered to God. And when anger wants to blow its top, the fruit of the Spirit ought to answer the call and turn the stove down so it doesn't boil over. Everybody all right? Yeah, we talk about the fruit of the Spirit all the time. And we talk about love. We talk about joy. We talk about peace. Sounds like a hippie song from the 70s if you're not careful. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We don't talk about that one a whole lot. Self-control means control your mouth, control your mind, control your emotions. Everybody all right? You and I ought to be able to have self-control. The Spirit of God is bigger than your anger. The Spirit of God can soften you. The Spirit of God can make you a tender man. The Spirit of God ought to be able to give you the self-control of anything that might want to get control of you. Anything. Whether it's fear or whether it's despair, whether it's anxiety, whether it's depression, or whether it's, it's anger, the Spirit of God ought to be able to help you get over it rather than it getting over you. Is everybody all right today? Listen, I, I, I want to I tell you all that anger is part of life, but it shouldn't define your life. If your children say, why is daddy always angry? Man, listen to me. Sir, brother, you have a problem that you need to deal with. If this is the one defining characteristic that your family is recognizing, a sermon is not going to solve your problem, but maybe it's a good start. If you're a consistently angry person and you feel like Moses, like it's just right under the surface and the slightest little thing is going to just tick you off. Listen, that's not a character trait. That's a character flaw. That, that needs to be not just pushed down. It needs to be removed. And, and uh, last time I learned is that God's word is sharper than a double-edged sword and that means it's like a scalpel. It'll do surgery and cut that out of your life. I, I've met many a man, many a woman who come to me over the years and say, you wouldn't have liked me before I came to know Christ or when I first became a Christian. I let anger, I let this or that control me. I, 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 I would fly off the handle, blah, 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 blah. And I would just look at that person because I knew that person. And I never saw any evidence in them that that was ever there unless they would have told me. I would have never believed it. They got victory over it. God, God removed it. God did surgery on them. A spiritual surgery there where he cut that out. And I'm here to tell you that, that uh, listen, I'm calling you out today. I don't care who you are. Man, woman, boy, or girl, grandpa, grandma, 
Mom or dad, listen to me very carefully. How can the love of Christ compel us if anger is controlling us at the same time? It cannot happen. This is something that's got to be dealt with. It's like salt and fresh water trying to flow through the same spring. Salt water is going to contaminate the fresh every single time. Don't let anger or any other overwhelming emotion contaminate you and all the other good that God wants to do through you. The, the, the power of the Holy Spirit is, is to take this body of flesh and redeem us to being born again and then to live within us to, to help us become a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, all things become new. That we might be new people created in the image of Christ. That reflects the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control of the Spirit. I don't have those in me. You don't have those in you. It's the Spirit in you that has those. And it's the Spirit in you that if you allow the Spirit to lead your life and you get out of the way, it's called surrender. You allow the Spirit of God... To live through you and empower you and, and compel you to, to live your life. I'm telling you, anger will never be an issue again. The Holy Spirit can deliver you from this. I've seen it happen. I have. And so have you. I see so many Baptist amens. Just people amening like crazy this morning. It's like the pigeons are doing this stuff. You know how the pigeons do that? So, so n n y'all ain't mad at me today, right? Well, I hadn't, I hadn't, I hadn't said enough yet. Let me, let me try to get you mad real quick. <laughs> let me do the tea life with you, and I'll close with this because I want I want to close this out because I, I listen. I, I know, I know anger. B before I became a Christian, this was my problem. Only through Christ did I ever get victory over this. But I've ruined relationships and friendships. And I've had consequences because of my anger in my past. And I'm telling you, God's spirit is greater than your anger. He can not only squelch it. He can not only just, just compel it and, and replace it with love. He can get it out of your life completely. But you got to learn something. Number one, in your, in your outline of tea life, and tea life is, is being transformed from the inside out where we can love God and love others and serve. When you feel a meltdown coming on, learn to stop it before it starts. You know what I'm talking about. You can feel the temperature arising. As Johnny Cash would say, I hear the train of coming. You know what I'm talking about. You, psychology might call them triggers. I call it somebody just turned up the heat. And you feel that anger rising. That's when you need to get out of that situation. Right then. Because if you stay in that situation, you stay in that conversation, you stay in that room, you stay with that person... That anger may just get the best of you. And you might do something that you're going to regret. Psychology might call that a trigger. I say that as a Christian, you need to recognize that you're, you're, on, the, you're on the verge of sin. You're getting ready to act upon a, an emotion that's getting ready to, to run wildfire in your life. And you're getting ready to burn up yourself and burn everybody around you if you don't get out of that situation. You've got to learn how to shut your mouth and walk away. Because if you're still dealing with anger, anger and you still feel that meltdown coming on, listen, Moses, all the way to the end of his life, did it. I'm convinced that any one of us can. I know that. And if we're not careful, 
we'll, we'll harm our testimony and we'll harm our testimony of Christ. Everybody all right? Well, if that doesn't make you mad, this next one might. Number two. Do you have a character flaw like anger or fear or pride that defines you? Anger is like fire that burns you and everybody else. Fear makes you want to run and hide. Pride is when all you do is talk about yourself. Self, 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 self. Your whole focus. Psychology calls it narcissism. I call it selfishness. Listen, we all have our flaws. None of us is perfect. But we need to be very, very careful that none of these flaws define you. In other words, when other people think of you, you don't want them to think of your name and then anger. You don't, want to think, you don't want them to think of your name and think arrogance. You don't want them to think of your name and then think of your flaw. If they think of you and then think of your flaw, then that flaw is defining you. Does that make sense? That flaw is showing itself. That flaw is apparent to others. That flaw is what Christ died for. To remove it. To help you give victory over it. Listen, we are overcomers. We're more than conquerors through Christ. That, that, those character flaws, these emotional whirlwinds that happen in our lives, they should not define us. We should define them. And we can do that through Christ. That's what I'm preaching on this month. Next week, we're talking about fear. The following week, we're talking about despair. And the last week, we're talking about pride. That, last, that point right there is the whole series. Everybody looking forward to this? I am. We all have flaws. Just don't let it define you. Finally, God has given you everything you need to overcome, outgrow, and conquer your faults. He's given you the Word of God. He's given you the Spirit of God. He's given you His presence that you can overcome it, that you can outgrow it. Listen, when you, when you first become a Christian, you're still dealing with some of those non-Christian behaviors. Everybody all right? And, 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 Eventually, listen, tell me now if this isn't true. Tell me, the, tell me. I, I know it's true, but I, I just want us to testify. Through time and through discipline and through walking with the Lord and learning His Word, isn't it awesome Then one day you realize, I'm not that person anymore. I've outgrown it. I've overcome it. I'm a new creation in Christ. And I'm telling you, if He can do it for you, He can do it for me, He can do it for anybody. God has given you everything you need to overcome, outgrow, and conquer these faults. You might be here saying, Pastor, on the inside, you might be yelling, I, I, can't, I, I can't control my anger. God can. But Pastor, you don't understand. I, I can't get over my fear. God can. God can take your, your I am's and turn them into I used to be. I used to be angry instead of I am angry. And I used to be afraid instead of I am afraid. I'm telling you, God can take your pride and turn it into humility. God can take anything and turn it into what he wants to turn it to. But you have to surrender to him. This is not a magic formula. I can't wave a magic wand. That's not what this is about. You have to surrender to God. Not just once, but that's not enough. That's where you begin, though. You surrender your life to Jesus Christ, and then you continue to surrender daily, hourly, and sometimes moment by moment. You surrender. You can outgrow your anger. You can learn to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. You can learn how to fight fair in marriage. You're going to fight. Just learn how to fight fair. Fight biblically. Attack the behavior, not the person. This isn't a marriage seminar, but, but that's a good start. Listen, it's really simple. This isn't about you. This is about Christ in you. And John the Baptist understood what he meant by what, what's meant by this. He must increase, I must decrease. 
Paul understood it when he said, I am crucified with Christ. I no longer live the life I now live. I live by faith in the Son of God. And finally this. Here it is. Where the rubber hits the road. The very last thing I want to say is, do you live by flesh or do you live by faith? It's your choice. And I pray you'll choose to live by faith. As our worship team comes, as we bow our heads and our hearts in prayer, as we think about the character flaws that sometimes rear their ugly heads in our lives, Perhaps this morning is a wake-up call. Perhaps this morning is a time for, for you to surrender once again to the will and the way of God. Perhaps you need to lay something just on the altar before the Lord to say, God, here's my anger, here's my fear, here's my pride. Perhaps you need to lay your life before the Lord and say, Jesus, forgive me. Come into my life. I want to be saved today. Whatever your need is, God is here to answer. So, Father, we come before you. We recognize that it is not about us. It's about you. You have provided everything we need for salvation. Everything we need to outgrow and to overcome any of these flaws, these sins that so easily control us. And Father, I pray today that you will, as we sang a few moments ago, that you will provide a breakthrough today. I pray, Father, that you will give us a victory today. Father, I pray that you will bring us one step closer to the life of Christ that we desire to be. Help us grow in his likeness, in the way we live, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Would you stand and worship the King of Kings? Would you do business with God during this song? Our altar is open if this is a place that you want to kneel before the Lord. We have people that will pray with you and for you. You come as the Lord leads. We're here to give it all to him in Jesus name draw me close to you never let me go I lay it all down again I hear you say that I'm your My desire, no one else will do. And nothing else can take your place. Feel the warmth of your embrace. So help me find a way. Bring me back, back to you. You're all I want, church. Sing this song. You're all I want.
nothing else can take your place. Feel the warmth of your Help me find a way. Bring me back to you. You're all I want. Somebody say glory if it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. Glory. Amen. Well, let's have our closing commitment and we'll be dismissed. Remember, from this place, as we leave, that's when the service really begins. Amen? Amen. Amen. Steve, come and lead us. Angela, come on, sweetheart. Let's say this together. Lord Jesus, I surrender to you. Thank you.